interaction we can do for everyone, the better at the moment. So just try and keep talking to people and do the stuff. So thanks for Gus and Darren for putting this together with the questions. We've had a good few questions come through already. Um, from people from RSVP and the email and stuff like that in. So uh, we'll try and keep this as possible. So just to make it easy for the two lads to get through the questions we have so far, we'll just keep it on the, on the right-hand side where you're on the attendee list. Everyone's muted automatically. Question that the lads are talking about, you can just press the raise your hand function or you can put it into the Q&A box at the bottom as well. And we'll get to it as soon as possible. And we can go through. There will be time afterwards, but we're going to try and keep it an hour so we can try and get done by half six. We've got 15 minutes left. We'll just give you a quick nod just to let people know how long's left and any questions. And we're going to record this talk as well. So it's being recorded. So if you're not supposed to be here, you shouldn't be here right now. Or if you're here with someone you shouldn't be, now's a good time to, to leave as well. But uh, if you're here, you're that's a good start. So we're going to record this and we're going to put the talk out online afterward as well. And then over the next few weeks, when we do a few more, uh, hopefully we can get out of this isolation soon. But if we're not, we're going to try and keep this going a few different talks and a few different subjects. So we will uh, let the lads crack away. So I don't think we need to introduce Gus or Darren much. The two lads love talking themselves, particularly both of them. So they do their own intros and explain how great they are and what they do and what they're going to do. And uh, we'll pass over to Darren. Darren. Excellent. So I see that I've been unmuted. So you, sh you guys should be hearing me now at the moment. I hope so. So. First of all, welcome to this. And uh, I have to say, uh, forgive me because it's my first time I do a webinar, so I'm gonna probably make a mistake or two you, or many. You and me both, buddy. Yeah, and I hope that you guys will be uh, forgiving. But we try to do our best. It's uh, with the limited uh, opportunity that we have here through video. And so this is a, um, this was once be an AMA, ask me anything about agile testing. So one of the questions that uh, I have had, have been asked for many, many years by a lot of people uh, when talking about agile testing is, um, well, what is the difference between testing and agile testing? Why is there an agile testing at all? And that's a very, very good question, a very valid question. Uh, there's been this discussion, this conversation has been going on for a long time now among uh, a lot of test people uh, working in Agile and non in Agile. And uh, I learned a lot by listening to this and I have my own opinion why there is an Agile testing. The common uh, understanding, the common answer that I have had to this question uh, from people, from people in the community, for, from experienced testers and uh, new testers is uh, kind of consolidate into something like uh, testing is testing, agile is context. Do I agree with this? I agree, but there is more than this. In this case, in my opinion, uh, testing is testing is true, agile is context. But in this case, I believe that the context overwhelms the activity. Testing is the activity, is what we do. The context is agile and agile team. And I believe that the changes that have been brought to testing through the agility are enormous and have overwhelmed the testing as such. So I'm happy to say that testing is still testing, but we have added so much more to it. And I want to give you an example to try to explain what I mean with this. So I uh, grew up in Italy uh, and uh, say that I was, I, was, uh, I was born in 1970. So let's say from the late 70s to the mid 80s, all I did every single day of my life was getting outside on the street and playing football. So the activity, we were playing football. What I would do after school, just drop the stuff in the house, run outside, find a friend with a ball and start playing. And that was the activity of playing football. We would play in our school clothes, we didn't have uh, certainly spikes on our shoes. Uh, we didn't have uh, jerseys or shorts. We had a ball that was rubber, often plastic. It was never a proper ball. We would uh, have uh, the goalposts were maybe two rucksacks, put one on which side of the, of the keeper. Uh, there might be games that there would be 10 people, five against five. Other games would be seven people, four against three. 
In some games we are keepers. In some games we don't have, we didn't have keepers. So it was obviously football, playing football. But if we compare it to, for example, uh, a Champions League game between Real Madrid and Juventus, how many are the similarities between this of the activity of football? Yes, there is a ball, it's a different one. Yes, people kick it around and they need to score goals. But there are, the differences are so big, so enormous. So the context is so important and so overwhelming to the activity that the activity changes itself. And that's where I believe that Agile, in my opinion, has changed and broadened the um, testing. So let me give you a couple of uh, examples of where this happens and this, uh, it's very, very obvious. So the first example is, uh, I see Fran there. So Fran is one that I know for sure that has had the luxury of working on uh, waterfall projects for many, many years before even Agile, Agile was even uh, existed, just like me. And uh, Fran will be able to tell you, like I can tell you, that uh, we were working on projects that were spanning for one year, two years, three years. I worked on a project that was three years long. That means that from when the project started to when the customer used it for the first time, there were three years in the middle. Today, we work, Agile teams release weekly, release bi-weekly, release monthly at the max. Some teams that are much more, maybe more advanced, release every minute, every second. There are, um, there are organizations that have uh, multi, multi, multiple release within uh, a second. If you look at how Amazon works. So this change, it's enormous. When we were working in waterfall and there were phases in which if, for example, let's say that for a two years product, project, there would have been six months of uh, analysis. Then there would have been another eight, nine months of uh, development. And then the remaining was testing. In this case, things like regression was not a big problem because we were regressing, we were gonna do the regression at the end, at the very end before releasing the product. Because we were basically delivering this thing in such a long time and we only needed to regress it once or maybe twice if there had been a, some massive change, we had discovered some massive bug towards the end. With, if we want to release every week or every two weeks or every month or even every few seconds, we certainly cannot think about running regression every second or running regression every week, because this would be just too much overwhelming for the people. And that's where automation came through to help with this activity. So the difference in this case on testing and non regression is so big that overwhelms the activity of testing, in my opinion. Another example that I want to make where rather than overwhelming expands the scope of tests, in my opinion, is the fact that today, a lot of the organizations that do Agile properly, properly, Agile well, they are, they are um, good Agile practitioners, understand that testing is also part of how we discover what we want to build. A lot of organizations today run testing, run experiments in production, to, work, to validate their hypothesis. And these experiments are tests. So today, a lot of organizations decide whether to do a change, or whether to apply a new, a new feature, or whether to make a, any change to, the, to their product by doing experiments with the live customers. This was not happening before, in, uh, when we were working in Waterfall. We did not have hypotheses. We had we were convinced that this is how the product, product is going to work, this is how people will, will use it, and these are the results that we will get. We discovered then that this wasn't always um, true. But in this case, again, with agility, testing expands into validating hypotheses. So in this case, again, the, the context of agility not only makes testing different, but expands its scope. 
So that's why, in my opinion, it's very important to have, to call it agile testing and not only testing. Because as I mentioned for the football, the kids going in the street and throwing the ball right and left are very, very different from Juventus playing against uh, Liverpool or Manchester United playing against Manchester City. It's completely, the context overwhelms the activity. And this is what I believe is the difference between testing and agile testing. I was wondering if, you, if there are any questions on this specific topic before I moved. Okay, so let's say that, uh, and actually I just saw this, that Lisa Grispin joined us, that uh, it's an honor Hi. and now I'm, ter I'm terrified of uh, saying something. <laughs> <laughs> completely wrong because Lisa Grispin, as you know, is uh, one of the one of the real the people that invented invented in a way uh, agile testing. She wrote two books called Agile Testing, Agile Testing, and More Agile Testing. And there is also now the new book called Three books, Agile right? Testing, yeah. Agile Testing Condensed. So that and that, uh, I haven't read the third one yet, and I will. And I would recommend it to anybody that is interested in understanding what Agile Testing is, to read um, Lisa Grispin and uh, Janet Gregory's books. Um, okay, so I'm uh, done with this. Lisa says that we are too nice, but no, no, it's due. <laughs> and uh, then I'm gonna pass uh, to Darren for the next question. So I, I want to remind you guys that uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna an ask, answer the questions that we, we already have received, but feel free to use the chat to ask deeper questions of what we're talking about now. Yeah, okay. there's a there's Thank a you. Q and A section. There's a Q and A section at the bottom as well. Something or other. Yes, it is my birthday. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just said that. Uh, but if anyone wants to ask a question, you can just raise your hand at any time, or just put put it in the Q and A box, and the two lads will get to it pretty quickly. Oh, Excellent. Tell Bob so, I was asking for him, Lisa. Um, okay, so okay, Darren, yeah, it's yours. The, all yours. Yeah, there's a Q&A section at the bottom. Uh, I think you can raise your hand as well. So if you have any questions when either of us are talking, just hit that button. And I've, I've not used this before, so I have no idea what's going to happen. But sure, we figure it out. OK, so a question that was. When you raise your hand. Uh, say that again, Paddy? It just sends you a point every time you raise your hand, so you get points. Oh. OK, cool. Perfect. Um, Okay, so we got a question from Kieran. Uh, two questions, really, and it it said, "Can a team realistically develop, test, and automate the test in a single sprint, and should they even try?" Uh, I guess yes and yes. Next question. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. Um, can a team realistically develop, test, and automate a test in a single sprint? Yes, yeah, can, but I guess it all depends on how you're doing your testing. So. What a lot of teams end up doing is leaving testing towards the end of the sprint. So, I mean, in my experience, when I was working as a tester on some scrum teams, that would happen. The testers would kind of have nothing really to do until the last two days of the sprint. And suddenly there'd be this massive panic. So you have a two week maybe or a three week sprint. And suddenly the last two days is all just like, ah, we have to test all these 15 stories and we have to get everything done and we have to kind of get it over the line. And, and suddenly it becomes, not not good enough or we're finding bugs at the last minute but it doesn't really matter we're kind of going ah we can release with these bugs so i guess the, the question really is is um is at the end of the sprint you're supposed to be able to scrum tells us that you're supposed to have something releasable so the question is is it releasable if it's not tested uh the answer obviously not right so we can use certain tools to kind of figure that out, right? So I guess if you're if you were to not to not to keep hammering on about Lisa's books, but if you were to read these books, <laughs> the answers are the answers are very much in there. But but uh, a, a little trick that that I kind of do or I've been using as well, and I pretty much stole it from Gus who stole it from other people, so it's fine. Um is to try and I there's a different views on the term left shifting testing or right shifting testing. People, I don't know, people don't like that term or whatever, but it makes perfect sense if you look at it from the point of view of a, of a, of a Kanban board or a scrum board. So say you have next to do in progress test done, right? And 
stuff gets blocked in test. The idea being that if we can left shift the testing so we can get the developers to start thinking about testing earlier. So what I'd suggest doing here is um, try something like behavioral driven development. Um, because that is, I mean, people say it's a testing tool. It's, it's not a testing tool, it's a conversation tool. So what you, what you do is uh, you get your three amigos, you get your tester, you get your business analyst, and you get your developer to sit in, a, sit in a little meeting together for five or 10 minutes just talking about the story. So they can talk through the user acceptance criteria that might have been written in there. Uh, and the idea being that the tester at this point can start testing. The tester can be like, okay, well, I'm going to try this, this, and this, and this, since they're the acceptance criteria. Oh, we know that. Brilliant. So the developer can start working alongside the tester straight away. Uh, that stops this whole, oh, it's gotten to the end of the sprint and we haven't tested it yet. Suddenly you're testing at the very start. Before any code is written, you're suddenly testing. It's, uh, it's, re it's really cool. And the, the fallout kind of from using behavioral driven development is that you get automated test scripts. They, they are just one of the fallouts from BDD. So at the end of the story, when the story is completed, your tests are automated as well. Uh, if you write them properly, you write them from a business point of view. That's why the business analyst is there. So everyone can understand exactly what's going on with the, with the piece of software. Uh, and it just it's, it solves your testing. So when the testing does hit the lane, or when the story does hit the lane that's just testing on your board, at that stage, instead of going through a spreadsheet and mind-numbingly mind -numbingly making boxes go green and raising bugs, you can just do some exploratory testing there. So you can just sit down and start playing with the software as if you were a user. I like to use my father. Uh, I like to channel my father when I'm exploratory testing because he's the least technical person I know. And if there's a bug in some software, he's going to find it. And I don't know what he does, but every single time I go home, there's some new bug or he's managed to break his laptop some amazing way. So I like to channel him when I'm exploratory testing. Um, now, should you even try? Yes, definitely try. I recommend looking up, uh, obviously, Dan, Dan North's Dan North stuff on BDD because he, he pretty much invented it. But also, John Ferguson Smart has got some really, really, really good blog posts, and he's got really, some really good stuff in there for behavioral-driven development. So I think um, if you can kind of help your team, if you can kind of coach your team to be more focused on trying to be preventive, instead of raising bugs and then trying to fix them afterwards. But if you're trying to fix the bugs as you find them or try and even prevent them from happening, yeah, you can, you can uh, easily test and automate in a single sprint, especially if you get the tester and the developer to work together as a pair. So if you have an automation engineer and you have a developer, just get them to pair up. Automation engineering is just development anyway. So they're both going to be writing code. They can, they can work together and you never know that maybe the tester could become a developer as well. I've, I've been on, teams where that's happened. Um, oh. Oh, Lisa has just said the discovery book by Sip Rose and Gaspar Nagy. I probably spe uh, spelled that wrong. Jesus, I probably pronounced that wrong. Uh, okay. So that is... I, I think that's, that's a great um, answer, uh, uh, Darren. I really like your answer. And uh, I, I think if I can add just a little bit, mm. Because this question do. Get, gets asked quite often, in particular from teams that are transitioning from maybe before we're not working in an agile way and they've become working in an agile way. That question, what that question hides inside it is the fact that the team yet cannot collaborate very well. Because think about it. As you, say, as you really correctly say, if something is not tested, it does not work, cannot be released. So 100%. the old team is responsible for writing the testing. So if, me, if you end up having, uh, not having time to write the automation, because maybe there is one person who writes automation, that's a signal for the fact that the team does not yet understand completely collaboration. Yeah, true. Because the team should be able to help or schedule enough uh, amount of work so that the person or the person and the other guys together can deliver the automation within the sprint. So a lot of the times this comes, it's basically something that we bring with us from the old time in which there were handovers from 
the, the analysts to the developers, from the developers to the testers. And there was this kind of feeling, that's not my job, that's the tester's job. A real agile team understands that all the activities need to happen within a sprint or within a, a time frame, And the real agile team will work together to find ways so that uh, that activity happens. That means, that could mean easily that uh, maybe for a sprint, a developer helps a tester write the automation. They write it together. They pair program their test together. This means that uh, they will have to be, the team will have to collaborate, find a way of delivering uh, something, including the testing. And if this, at the beginning, uh, um, the testers are basically late because they cannot catch up, it means that obviously when uh, the team has been planning, they haven't thought about the fact that these guys wouldn't have time. So they yeah. have to find different ways of doing yeah. it. So I think a lot, a lot is um, that, you know, the, the massive difference that happens in agile teams when they mature is when they understand that they're responsible for everything. They're not responsible for the artifacts. The developer is not responsible for his code. The developer is responsible for the value that goes to the customer. The, the, the tester is not responsible for his tests. The, the tester is responsible for the value to be delivered to the customer. So I think a lot, and I mean, to be honest with me, uh, collaboration is the, the, the fundamental part, the most important part that uh, will allow agile teams to deliver. I completely agree. And that's why I, I, I really emphasize the, the use of behavioral driven development, because it's just, it just gets people talking. It, it really does. And I've seen, I've seen in, in instances where a certain team I was working on, the regression suite took eight hours to run and it was just painful. So when I started introducing BDD and I got the developers collaborating, there was a test code base here and then there was a development code base over here. So I got a couple of the developers to, to merge the two. So the test code lived alongside with the, with the developer's code and suddenly they had access to it. Suddenly they were like, wait a minute, this doesn't have to be eight hours long. So during Slack time and uh, like kind of in downtime in between stories, they got the regression suite from eight hours down to half an hour which is amazing, you know, moving a lot of the tests to unit tests. And like, it's, it's really interesting when you start sharing your work with the developers, you start seeing the amount of waste and the amount of rework that's happening. Cause you don't know that they've already, they've already written unit tests to cover half these edge cases. You don't know anything like that. Right. Or if you're trying to write a, a regression suite, they don't realize that it takes, I don't know, two minutes to run a Selenium test as opposed to, 10 seconds to run a unit test. I am just pulling numbers out of the air here. So I don't know, <laughs> the current, the current state of Selenium. But when I was using Selenium, it was very slow, very kind of, you know, brittle. So you wanted to kind of move as many tests to unit as possible, but that's only possible when you're talking and, and working with a, with a developer. Yep. All right, Gus, do you want to take the next question? Excellent. So I see already we have other questions coming through. So uh, it's great, great, great. And I'm going to go to the next one that we received uh, earlier. And this actually, uh, Fran sent this question. So the question is, <clears throat> Yay, Fran. Agility would generally be seen as a key enabler to DevOps initiative. Any issues, challenges, experience? Okay. First of all, I agree. Actually, I go beyond agreeing. Uh, when DevOps came out first, uh, I actually did not consider it as anything extra on top of Agile. DevOps to me is uh, expanding collaboration to another layer. Expanding collaboration between uh, the development teams, the developer that write the code and uh, the infrastructure teams, or now if you're on the cloud, whatever you want, but let's talk about infrastructure team now in this case. So when, for example, you think that uh, um, a Scrum team, now I don't have the, uh, the, the, the definition, it's on the, on the Scrum, Scrum guide or whatever, but the, a Scrum team is a, a team that contains all the skills that are necessary to envision, analyze, develop, test, and maintain a complex product. So these are all the activities and the they define what the team is. It's a team that is able to do all of that. Now, often 
when uh, teams have started to go agile, they manage to do the most of the things, but then when it comes to releasing to production, becomes a problem. And the problem comes from uh, something that we inherit from uh, the old style in which there were different teams. There was a development team, like an application team and an infrastructure team. And uh, having these two silos talk to each other was not always easy. We know that when there are silos, there are political problems. There is, oh no, this is, uh, this is our thing, this is our thing, you don't touch that, I touch that, et cetera. And what I, where I see that DevOps um, is very, can be very successful is that breaking down the silo. I can give you an example of uh, how we are trying to apply this uh, when we were, when I was working with Darren, by the way, in Paddy Power. Uh, so we did, we initially had agile teams and uh, we found the problem with, uh, we, we weren't able to deploy as many times as we wanted to. And uh, we found that we had a lot of resistance from the infrastructure team that rightly so were worried about what we were doing. If we were knocking down the servers, if we were making uh, services unac uh, not accessible, etc. So they were rightly worried about what we were trying to do and the fact that we wanted to release so often. What we did, and that there was, there was a, a long battle and struggle to, to try to release more often. The way that we resolved the problem was just with true full transparency, meaning that we started working together, the development teams, with some of the infrastructure engineers working together in the same team. When this happened, what happened, the first thing that happened was that uh, before we had infrastructure engineers saying that the developers knew nothing because they knocked down servers, they didn't know what to do, blah, blah, blah. And on the other side, the developers were complaining about the infrastructure engineer that they didn't want to deploy something because for some stupid reason. Once they started working together, they understood that they both were resolving important problems. They appreciated the work that the other was doing. And that was the very first point, the very first moment in which we were breaking down the silo. We weren't just saying, take this, put it there. We were saying, I am building this this way. How can you help me build it in a way that we can deploy it faster? And that was the first start, the starting of our DevOps, DevOps initiative. So to me, DevOps is extended collaboration. And uh, so, and that's where, that's where it needs to start. Obviously, um, then DevOps means a lot, means a lot. Now today, uh, we can deliver very, very often. We can have a total observability on uh, what's happening out there when the customer are using our application. Um, we can uh, uh, experiment and make a, a test our hypothesis very quickly because of the fact that we can uh, deliver things very quickly, very frequently. And uh, so the DevOps, so if you, if you ask me about the challenges, so the, the political issues were silos, and once we got the people working together, and they started appreciating the importance of each other's work and started collaborating towards the, the only goal that was giving the, cost, the value to the customer, then good things started to happen. Um, and then obviously there is also some, something else that needs to change if you, want to be, if you want to operate in a DevOps way and deliver very often. When I say very often, maybe every day, or multiple times a day, etc. And that is that you really need to deliver in a certain way. So in this case, things like uh, delivering uh, um, thin vertical slices of value, that means we need, to, we need to focus on delivering value to the customer. We cannot focus on the different layers of the architecture. We cannot have people working in this junction from uh, somebody doing the database, somebody else doing the front end, et cetera, and not talking to each other because what we want to deliver is something that functions for the customer. And to do this, and one thing that I found that it's very difficult at the beginning at least, is to create these very thin slices of value. At the beginning, people think, oh no, we can't, how can we do, this story is too big. This is one thing that we, we hear quite a lot, you know, this story is too big, it can take too long. And it takes a lot 
to try to find a way of delivering really, really thin slices of verti uh, thin vertical slices of value. And that's a skill that is very difficult and uh, can be acquired. Uh, basically means uh, releasing a really, really small batch of code very frequently that not only uh, basically you can release more frequently, but you also reduce the risk of the impact of what you're doing. Because if you release a, um, a very, very small um, feature versus releasing something that you've been working on for two months, the risk of the first having a problem in production is much lower than the risk of the big um, piece of uh, software uh, that you release every two months. So there is a, there is a, extra benefits to the fact that we manage to, de to, to um, define such a small piece of value to deliver. Uh, so that was me for DevOps, and I'll pass you back to Darren. Yeah, just saw Fran messaged in the chat there, because he said, totally agree. Uh, yeah. Extended collaboration, not a very separate DevOps, not a very separate DevOps team that I've seen sometimes. I've seen oh, that yeah, as well, yeah. Fran. Yeah, I let me say that. that. Let, let me say that. <laughs> this, I think, is very important. Well, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I don't know why, but uh, a lot of organizations have a DevOps team. I'm not saying straight away it's the wrong thing. I'm just saying that uh, it kind of defeats, in my opinion, defeats the purpose. Uh, I believe that the DevOps takes two silos, that were development and infrastructure, and merges it into one. Having a DevOps team recreates another silo there. And I've seen in some cases, when this is misunderstood, it can create an extra silo, even possibly worse than it was before. Uh, so, because the understanding, uh, there is a lot, of, uh, there are a lot of misunderstanding about the fact that DevOps is a set of tools. DevOps, DevOps is a set of tools that you install and you run, and to be honest, in my opinion, it couldn't be further away from the truth. That's because Microsoft named their tool DevOps. You can blame oh, them. Oh, well, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, DevOps is about doing something together, expanding the level of collaboration. Um, okay, I think I'm done there. Darren? <laughs> Okay, so the next question we had was, uh, if you could start from scratch, how would you approach building a suite of tests in an agile environment? And that was from Joan. Uh, that's a great question. It's my favorite question ever, because I'm going to go and talk about Kanban, which is the best subject ever. <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if you're a complete and utter geek like me. Um, okay, so... How would you start from scratch? Starting from scratch is great because usually what happens is you, 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 you go join a team and there's already uh, a massive eight or 10 hour overnight regression suite in place. And then it can be nearly a bit more difficult. But if you're starting from scratch, fantastic. Use Kanban. <laughs> um, there's two rules of Kanban. Scrum has, Scrum has some, as we all know, has, has a lot of rules, different ceremonies, different things, uh, which you can still use in, in a Kanban-like environment. Um, but the two rules of Kanban are really visualize, visualize all your work uh, and limit your work in progress. That, that's it. They're the two rules. So to do this from a testing point of view, I'm going to try, I'm going to try and share my screen and use a whiteboard here. So this could be an absolute disaster. Let's see what Go happens. Well, hey, I promise you I won't draw Sonic the Hedgehog or Earthworm Jim. Can people see my, can people yes. see the whiteboard? Yes. Everybody? Can somebody message in the chat? Yeah, we can all see it, yeah. Perfect, uh, yeah, fantastic. We can see your whiteboard, yeah. Amazing, okay. Uh, all right, so what I do starting from scratch is, I don't want to use this bloody thing. What are you shouting at me for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So you want to you want a Kanban board, right? So I'm just going to start with some, oh my God, this looks absolutely horrible. <laughs> I'm going somewhere with this. Okay. <laughs> oh, Gus used to say something cool about Kanban boards. They should be so <laughs> when our teams when our teams started using them for the first time. We used to we used to always make them look really really pretty and they were really nice and you know people were then afraid to change them. So Gus was like, "No, nah, make them look sloppy. If they're sloppy, then you'll want to change it." So it encourages people to think about the prog the process more often and change it. Okay. So say, uh, ooh, can I type here? Oh, brilliant. So there's your first column, right? 
Um, now you're going to say, so this will be a standard kind of Kanban-y type board I should have prepared earlier because I probably was going to knew I was going to do this. Ah, oh, fuck it. Okay, right. Well, why can't I move this? Hello? All right, you get the idea. Um, dev, test, etc., etc. All right, so they're not exactly lined up, but who cares? So this is where I'd start with building a regression suite, right? And this is your three amigos. So this is the BDD, the behavioral driven development stuff I was talking about earlier. So you get your story, whatever, you stick them in wherever you got them. Uh, you stick them in next, they're ready for the team to work on. The first, the first lane on your, on your Kanban board is three amigos, okay? So this is your BDD. This is your developer, your tester, and your analysis sitting together and working together. Uh, this is where you start writing the tests, okay? So um, at this stage, uh, you can also have, also have lane policies. So a lane policy would mean that there's a, a list of rules, so three or four rules that you have to meet to move the story from one lane to the next lane. So for the, the three amigos, the, the lane policies could be full understanding of the acceptance criteria, uh, um, test, uh, test, uh, test scripts written or examples, examples written. So you can break the acceptance criteria down into examples, which become given when then tests, right? And they become your test automation, which I'm sure when, when people think of BDD a lot, they think of, oh, uh, I write my tests given when then, therefore I do BDD. It's kind of like Gus and DevOps. Oh, we have a DevOps team, therefore we do DevOps. No, that's not strictly true. So if you're writing tests and given when then, brilliant. Okay. That's that's half the, the battle. But the real the real magic is when you're talking to the developer. So if everyone if all the if all the requirements become given when then automatable test steps, well then you start writing your tests straight away. So once the story hits dev, now I've seen a couple of things happen here. Uh, in I guess in a in a in a in one world, I'm not going to say an ideal world, but in one world, you could have a developer who writes uh, that the developer has been in the three amigos session, knows your given when then scenarios, knows the examples that are to be automated. The developer then writes the automation and then writes the, t the code to make the automation pass. So it's a red green refactor. So at that stage, that's you're flying. But what I've seen also work quite well is a developer and a tester will sit together. The tester and they'll kind of ping pong ping pong pair programming, if that, if that makes sense. You'll get a, uh, a tester will suddenly start writing the test, the, the acceptance test, and then the developer will write the code to make that acceptance test pass, and they'll work through it together like that. But either way, you're building your automation up as you go. And the more stuff, obviously, you can move to unit tests into a leaner, leaner approach that making you know, the tests faster, all that stuff will happen here. Uh, and then when it does hit test afterwards, uh, all that's left to do is if you build a, if you have a build pipeline and you have these tests that you've written with the developer hooked up to the build pipeline, they're going to fail, obviously, when anyone changes them or any code or whatever. That's your first line. That's your regression. It gets done on every single build, uh, which, is, which is magic. Uh, then when it does hit test, that's when you get to start playing, you know, doing exploratory testing, playing around with the software, making sure stuff works. And at this stage, your second rule of Kanban kicks in, right? The second rule was limit your work in progress. So if you have three developers on the team, you're only allowed three stories on the board at once, which means that when you're testing, you can pair with the developer, they can sit with you and see what you're doing, and that way you're teaching them how to exploratory test. Um, thus, you know, if you get hit by a bus or if you're sick or something, then they'll be able to help, help when you're out. Um, but also, if you find a bug here in this lane, you don't have to raise a bug anymore. You don't have to write a bug report. You don't have to fill in this stupid, here's my 20 things that I have to do to reproduce the, the bug, you know? You don't have to, because the developer's been sitting with you or he's sitting beside you and you can see it straight away. And because he's not moved on to another story, your whip limit's kicked in, he just fixes it straight away. So in, in that stage, you don't, you don't need to, you know, keep track of bugs anymore. It completely gets rid of them. Uh, and obviously then the next stage would be you demo it and then you 
you release it, right? But this is this is the king here, I think, for for really um, um, for building a test suite in an agile environment, and that's how you kind of do it going forward. Uh, I I I'd highly suggest this. And yet again, it's all about collaboration and pairing. Uh, if you can get if you can start working with the developers to see what you're doing, uh, especially if you're an automation engineer, because um, I think if you're an automation engineer and you're not pairing with a developer, then I think you're you're losing something, because they're gonna know they're gonna know they're gonna know that the code base an awful lot better, and you're gonna be able to learn so much more from them from just sitting and pairing with them. Um, that Excellent, is it. Darren. That is it. Can I stop sharing my screen? There we go. All righty. Okay. Excellent. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. I hope, so I hope that I, answered the question. I thought it was very good. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm biased. Okay, so <laughs> uh, I, I'm uh, conscious of the time, right? And, yeah, we, we have a few uh, questions after coming in, so I think we should yeah. make it to an A box and they'll go through in order if they've come through, if that's okay? Sure, so sure. We have, yeah. we, have, we have five questions in first, so we just ask if anyone who wants to jump in first who thinks the best answer can go. I think we both know you're going to both jump in anyway. But uh, the first question was from uh, Noxus, I'm not sure what your username is. Uh, what place do manual testers have in the move to test? You got cut off there, Paddy. What was the end of it? So the first question is, uh, what place do manual testers have in the move to test automation? Okay. So who wants to feel that? Okay, I can, I can take this. Right, um, go. Talking about manual testers, uh, uh, it's kind of, um, I, don't, I don't think that, that we, talk, we talk about manual tests, but they're not manual testers. Manual testers, uh, it's something that we, we have from the past when we used to write scripts uh, for months yeah. before then executing the scripts yeah. when we had the, the code. Um, manual tester, today I see people call themselves manual testers, but they do so much more than that. Uh, they don't only um, manually test the code, exploratory test code, but they also do other activities like collaborating with the developers. They can uh, um, help a test automator write uh, the the automation because maybe they understand more what what needs to be done in the in the in that specific situation. I think that uh, calling yourself a manual tester is reducing what you can do. What I would be looking at is look at your team and try to understand to listen listen what are the needs of these people. What do they need me to do? It's not necessary. There is not a necessary. Uh, move from manual tester to automation tester. I don't see that as something that is absolutely necessary. Is it good to be able to code? Certainly it is for a tester. Is it absolutely necessary? Not necessary. Because as we said before, it's the team as a whole that is responsible for everything. One, of, uh, one very common case in teams where I work, with, where I, I collaborated or I was working in or et cetera, if there was a manual tester, um, that was working in that team, this person would uh, use his skills and uh, use other people's skills to do the automation. So we had, uh, for example, in Buddy Power, 90% of the automation tests were written by the developers. Were the testers involved? Of course, they were defining the test together with the analyst, with the product owner, whoever you want. So it's a yeah. collaboration thing. So when you think, don't be John all yourself saying, I'm a manual tester. If you want to be an agile tester, you have your testing skills that are very strong. You don't know, not necessarily need to write to learn to code. It's not the nece a necessity. If you want to do it, it's a good thing. But it's a kind of a something. That, it's a kind of a myth that uh, every every tester needs to be an automated tester. I totally disagree because every tester needs though to have the skills, the communication skills the influencing skills and the ability to collaborate with the developer. That's the skill that you need to learn, I believe. When you have that skill, you will have automated tests, even if you cannot write code, because you collaborate with the team to make this happen. So I would suggest not to talk about manual tester. I am a tester, you can say, and I can yeah. help you with this. Um, I try, I'm, I'm trying to start the test coach revolution. You know, Call yourself a test coach. I'm yeah. coaching the team on how to test. Brilliant. Come yeah, on. Well, <laughs> look, absolutely. Because, look. 
Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Dan. Sorry. Because if you don't, I mean, I, I did computer science in college, right? I have a programming background, which you wouldn't believe if you've ever worked with me, because I hate it. But, <laughs> but I know I hate it, right? <laughs> and um, it, was, it was one of those things that when, when I started coding, I just don't, like, I know people who who go home from work and they boot up their machines and there's probably people on this call who do this they boot up their machines and they code for hours and they code all night and they just get this absolute love walter is walter here walter's on the call walter has this absolute love for, for coding that that i just never got i mean i get the same feeling when i'm playing guitar or something fine but but walter gets this absolute kick from coding and it's beautiful it's a wonderful thing and, and i really encourage it but some people don't get that right i am definitely one of them right and i know maria maria is on this call somewhere she's definitely one of them as well right but we were able to when we were working together we were able to be as testers not just manual testers we were able to as gus said influence the team and collaborate so we were more coaching we became coaches so i think instead of replace the term manual tester with test coach that's, that's, sure. that's what I said. That. Start a, uh, let's start a revolution. Thanks for the question, Shay. And just, just to finish on that as well, uh, Claudio Perone, a former uh, presenter of ours, going back a while now. Hey, Claudio. Hey, Claudio. <laughs> oh, no, Claudio. Claudio just commented quickly there saying, the first move is not necessary for manual testing to automation testing, but rather from someone who fixes bugs to someone who actively helps preventing them. So I'm oh, sure Darren, absolutely. Love that, Darren. Lovely. Darren's going to trademark that, I think, Claudio. Lovely, so. lovely, lovely. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, I'm, I'm stealing that, Claudio, yeah. 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 <laughs> trademark Darren down before he can able. And that's where uh, lean comes, you know. Claudio brought in uh, like a full wind of lean uh, <laughs> prevention, yeah. trying to help pre prevent the cool. effects cheers, rather cheers than fix in. Cheers, Claudio. So the next question, I won't ask you what to answer because she's actually specifically asked for Gus. So the next question, Gus, is from uh, Lisa. In that case, I'm just going to run to the bathroom real quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, Gus, Lisa's asked, uh, would you please share one of your favorite ways of influencing a team to adopt some new practice or address a particular problem? Okay. So, um, yeah, obviously, I work as, a, as an agile coach a lot of the times. I work with teams and all. And one of the things, it, it's... Um, it's not easy to get teams to start doing something, to change something. And uh, I believe that the, the, the easiest way of doing some change is by making the change small and sa fail to save. What do I mean with this is, if you go into a team and start saying, okay, now from today on, we're gonna start, uh, and you start adding um, set of process changes a lot a big change massive change people first of all will find it difficult to accept it because when there is change there is some psychological part of us telling us okay he's telling us to change it means that we were wrong before even though that's not the, the fact but that's the first thing and second big change is very risky you start making a big change and then everything fails and then where do you restart? So what I like to do, I like to do an agile way of adding, of making changes, of influencing change, is by creating a very short time experiment that is fail to save. Say for, uh, I'll give an example. You wanna try to use pair programming. The old style would be, okay, we're gonna call in uh, uh, a trainer, that trains the, the, the team, and then everybody's going to pair program for the rest of our lives. What I would suggest is maybe I take a couple of developers, I sit with them for a week, and we do pair programming together. If they're happy at the end, and if the, the code, uh, the quality has improved, if we feel that we're doing the right thing, then we stick with it. Otherwise, we revert back to whatever we were doing. So any change, I believe, to be accepted, first of all, needs to be people need to feel that actually it worked. So I cannot say, yeah, now we do pair programming for the rest of our lives, because I don't know, maybe in this context in which I am today, pair programming won't work. I do not know, I cannot possibly know. So what I prefer to do is to propose these changes as short experiments that we will reevaluate after maybe a week or two weeks, period of time, and then that will inform where you wanna go next. So that's the way I normally try to influence teams to make changes. Okay, cool. Thanks for that, Gus, and thanks for the you're question, welcome. Lisa. Uh, the next question will fire at you, Darren, just seeing that you're back from the Jacks. The next question <laughs> is from another regular friend of ours, Margaret. So Margaret's asked, 
Uh, Darren, what's your position on number one, creating testing tasks on a Scrum Kanban board? And number two, estimating time story points for testing activities. Uh, I hate estimation in general. <laughs> okay, so what I try and do, let's just start with estimation. Um, actually, it'll roll into both of them. If you write the acceptance criteria as a team. Okay, so what I've done in Scrum in the past, which is, which is interesting, in the... It took, it, took a, it took a bit of trust um, on the business analyst's part to, to, to buy into this, but, but it did work. So instead of uh, the poor business analyst going away or the product owner or whatever they're called, business manager or product manager, every, every company seems to have a different name, right, for, for the role of business analyst. But it's basically the person who writes all the stories and writes all the acceptance criteria. So... In the old school world, you'd write a specification document and you'd be given that blah de blah But in this, what happens currently usually, especially in Scrum teams, is the business analyst sits down and he writes all the stories or she writes all the stories and writes all the acceptance criteria for the stories and then takes them to the team and the team do story point estimation on it, right? So you play your planning poker. Um, and is it a five? Is it an eight? Is it a 12? Is it an elephant? Who knows? Nobody cares. It's all just random magic numbers. Um, Sorry, this is just my opinion on, on, on story point estimation. It really, it just, it really, it really, really irritates me because nobody bloody well knows anything coming out of a, a story point estimation session. So I started on a team that were doing this, okay? So what I said to the business analyst was, okay, could you do me a favor next week? And it was the same thing uh, that, Gus, that Gus suggested. We're gonna run an experiment here for two weeks, for the sprint was two weeks, for one sprint, for a sprint planning session where we would usually, uh, no, for our backlog refinement session, sorry, where we would usually story point estimate, what we're going to do is we're going to leave all the stories with no acceptance criteria in them. They're all going to be empty. And the whole team's going to sit in the meeting for two hours. It was a two-hour meeting. The team are going to sit in the meeting for two hours. And instead of arguing over whether it was a five or an eight or how long it takes to, I don't know, whatever, what we're going to do is we're going to write the acceptance criteria together using example mapping. So the fallout from that then is if you leave the rule of thumb that a story is roughly three to five examples, then each story is roughly the same size. So you don't need to estimate uh, because all your stories are roughly, uh, it's going to take uh, five days, five to seven days worth of development. So we know that for every single story. So they're all in eight or they're all a five, <laughs> which is the fallout from that, right? So what the team started doing was, I started it the first time because nobody had done it. So I just started going, okay, this story is, I don't know, insert a whatever the story was on the front end of some application, great, wonderful. All the, all the business analysts had going in there was the titles of the stories. That was it, no acceptance criteria. Business analyst obviously knew what he wanted uh, in this case. To, this to be. So I stood up at the whiteboard and went, okay, give me an example of how this software works. Oh, well, the user has to click this button to get there. Brilliant, grand. There's your first example. Second example, third example. This story had 10 examples. So what that told us was, well, the story is huge. It's 10 examples. Think about that. That's, that's very big. So we split the story into two. Suddenly we had two stories with five examples each. Brilliant, great. Those examples then become your acceptance tests. They become Boom, you're given one thens, they become your whatever, your, your regression suite. So in that way, you don't have to add time for, you don't have to estimate time for testing because you already know there's my tests. And if you keep it to the rule of thumb of three to five examples per story, roughly your stories are all going to be the same size. So you don't need to estimate anymore either. It's, a, it's really, really, really powerful, especially when you start getting, getting teams to work like that. Uh, much more, uh, sorry, the, the more teams start working like that, the better they get at it. So what I found was, uh, was really fun is, you know, somebody who sponsored the project or the whatever comes up to you and goes, oh, I have a feature that I want. You take it to the team, you let the team break it down the stories that way and you can go, okay, roughly, a story takes a week. That feature, we've, uh, we've split, that, we split that feature down into four stories. You're going to roughly have it in a month. You know, so you get to become more predictable with how you're going to deliver software. And it's, it's really, really powerful. That's, that's me. Excellent. Okay. 
Cool, thanks for that. So there's two more questions in there. So I'll fire it to the second last one out and one of you can jump in and then the other one can take the last question. So Paul, Paul Leonard has asked, is there an emerging industry ideal sprint length? Uh, okay, I don't think there is emerging industry. What I have observed, so 10 years ago, if somebody, if you were doing a, a sprint in a month, you were very good. 10 years ago, being able to do a sprint and deliver every month, you were very good. The more, you know, we improved in uh, how we, we, we are able to deliver more often. And now I see that a lot of teams are doing two bi-weekly sprints or even weekly sprints. So if there is an emerging industry ideal sprint, there isn't. But what I notice is that the time is shrinking. The time is shrinking also because, of course, we learn how to deliver in an agile way. Uh, the tools are better. Uh, and uh, so now we understand better how to deliver more often. Uh, I wouldn't say that there is a, uh, I don't think that there is an idea of sprint length. The, the idea sprint length is how often does our customer, do our customers need changes? That's what, should be, that's what drive, drives, um, uh, drives the sprint length. Uh, and obviously, uh, we, we get to extremes where some organizations, uh, as I said before, deliver multiple times a day, like a, even hundreds of times per day. Um, but no, there is no, so there is no uh, standard, but what I see is that uh, the time is shrinking. So we're getting better and better and deliver more, uh, delivering uh, more often. Okay, cool. I hope that answers your question there. Uh, the last question, uh, see the word Kanban, which is like your tattoo should be in your neck. So the last question Aaron, is from Eddie Cook. So Eddie's asked, Kanban, I think part of a successful deployment here is whether you go wide or deep with your flows. Wide or deep with your flows? Uh, I'm going to ask, Eddie, what do you mean? One second, let me just get Eddie there. You're still there. Give me one second. Where are we? Eddie, here we are. Mm -hmm. I so thought we know this, right? Hey, Eddie. Hey, Eddie. Yeah, I, guess, I guess what I meant, Darren, um, in terms of swim lanes, first of all, right? Um, right. I, I've worked where you've had, um, you know, you, you could go with three. So you've got a backlog, you've got in progress and done. And then okay. you build on, you know, you build in your flows and, um, after that. You know, the, all, the, all the business rules behind it when you, when you set up your JIRA boards, that sort of thing, right? Uh, or you you're talking, sorry, are you talking about just JIRA specifically? I suppose I am I, in my, in my I, experience, cause, yeah. Because I hate Jira for that, <laughs> very, for that very reason. You have to build your boards a weird specific way with flows. And, and then if you want to have a splinter board, your, your team, the other team has to have the same board. Because Yeah, I kind of hacked Jira. I started using a different board under the Jira board that was... <laughs> okay, so... Um, oh. I just stop using so I mean, if, if I can say something, <laughs> I would say that uh, uh, the Kanban is more than a Kanban board. When we talk about Kanban, yeah, yeah, Kanban yeah, is a method that's got loads of things. So now we, we don't have the time to, to go deep into this. But the, what I would say is that uh, if you're using Kanban, you would, have, you would not have uh, next doing and done. You would have no. real activities. Real 100%. activities and... Uh, Obviously, uh, you might, it depends on the workflow. You know, that's the number of activities that are on your Kanban board will derive from a conversation with your team when all the team together talks about what are the activities that allow us to take one card and deliver value to the customer. So the yeah. team can come up with all the headings, all the, the, the workflow of the Kanban board. So if you want to use the Kanban method or Kanban in general, then you need to look more deeply rather than only the board itself. You will have to look at whip limits. You will have to look at many, many other things. But certainly something that uh, I would uh, recommend people to do. And one, one immediate benefit that you have when you start uh, highlighting the, re the activity, so the workflow, is that you will then know what's happening. When you have to do doing done and you have 10 cards in doing, you don't know where the problems are. 
you might have the yeah. 10 cards that are in doing, might be all be in test, but you don't know that you need to go and help a tester because he's swamped by the amount of activity, the amount of activity that he has. If you add the activities separated, you would know that in testing, for example, there is a backlog, sorry, um, yeah, there, there is a long queue with eight cards there. So the team visually already knows we need to add this guy or this person or these yeah. two people that do testing to, to get the, um, the flow unblocked. Uh, so yeah, Kanban, th there'll be a lot to talk about. Let's, but I don't know if we, <laughs> I don't think we have the time now to do that. But, but uh, I guess Eddie, to solve your problem, um, just see, I'd start just visualizing with the team every single thing that the team does. And a good place to start, right, is I'd say most, pa most places have a, a scrum um, definition of done, right? So if you have a scrum definition of done for a story, that is, oh, tests have to be written and thing has the thing and demo and blah, 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 blah. They, they transition really well, your, your, your list. That list transitions really, really well to becoming lanes on a Kanban board. So instead of just having three lanes with, with inside doing, you have to hit all those 10 things. Those 10 things become your 10 lanes. And then you can drag the story across the lanes. And as Gus says, then you can start seeing problems and blockers. Uh, for a quick example, I know there's a couple of security friends of mine on this call, even though it's a Zoom call and they're probably tinfoil hatting right now, but hey, whatever. <laughs> Um, well, one, one problem I had in a company I was working with was the stories were stuck in ready for release and they got stuck there for weeks and weeks and weeks. And it turns out security was the problem. Security was the bottleneck. They hadn't signed off on it. And to get security's time, because there was only three of them or something in the company, to get their time was really, really hard because they were very busy. So what we tried to do in an experiment, but because we had the Kanban board, we were able to see, oh, that's why it's blocked. So what we did was instead of having a three amigo session, we changed it to a four amigo session and brought security in. So security were in that little 10 to 15 minute chat on every single story. And suddenly they're, they're like, oh, that's what you're doing. Oh, that's how you're testing it. Oh, well, yeah, okay, release that. That's fine. <laughs> it's, it was just a complete, there was a complete mismatch. But that kind of stuff, that's where the power is in Kanban, really. And also, yeah. if, you can, if you can try and get people to move away from Jira, do that. Jira is evil. <laughs> okay cool i think that just about sums up we're just over an hour so i think unless we have anything urgent we can probably leave it about there i'd say lads thanks darren thanks gus for all the questions there uh thanks thank everyone. you thanks for all the questions in as well we can't really do an ama without people asking questions so yeah thank you uh, obviously, over the next few weeks, uh, depending on what happens and what restrictions we have, we, we're probably going to end up doing maybe the next one, two, hopefully not maybe three or four meetups online, I think, depending on which way things go. So uh, I think we'll just embrace it instead of trying to be afraid of it. And uh, we have some people who are going to yeah. look to speak over the next few weeks, which is cool. Uh, if anyone does want to speak at meetups, do get in touch with any of us and we can point in the right direction. You can see it's pretty easy to set up with the webinar and it's very easy to go ahead and we can still get a good crowd and have a bit of crack and a drink as well. So it's still good fun. Uh, if you're watching this video afterwards, because it's going to be in the future as well, this is on YouTube tomorrow and up on our channels as well. Uh, if you have any questions or thoughts on any of the questions that the lads had, please reach out to either of them directly online. They're both very approachable. Darren, maybe not in the morning, but in the afternoon usually. <laughs> I'm a great morning person. <laughs> <laughs> They're both, uh, both approachable guys. But look, thanks so much for everyone coming and uh, we'll talk to you all soon, okay? Wash your hands and stay safe, guys. Thank you. Take Happy care. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Frederick. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, man.